tonight. Indonesia inundated. Flash floods and landslides kill 16 people on Indonesia's Sumatra Island. Rescue operations are underway. Seeking breakthrough. Ceasefire deal between Israel and Hezbollah is very close as Lebanon death toll climbs. Dangerous cycle. Russia-Ukraine war escalates as second presidential term for Trump looms. And Turkey pardon. Peach and Blossom travel to Washington where they were treated at the White House before their big day as is tradition. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We're here to bring you key stories across the globe and for this Tuesday evening, we begin today in Indonesia. Indonesian rescuers are searching for missing people after torrential rain hit North Sumatran province causing flash flooding and landslides which killed 15 people. 11 people were killed in landslides in Kapro district, Padang Lawas district and Tapanuli Selatan district and another four died in flash floods in Delhi Serdang district after the bad weather hit the nation. The disaster agency warned people in North Sumatra province to anticipate potential floods in the coming weeks as more heavy rain is forecast. Landslides are frequent in Indonesia, especially in the rainy season. The risk of landslides is often increased by deforestation and small-scale illegal mining operations in remote districts. Japan's space agency aborted an engine test for the Epsilon S rocket after it exploded and caught fire, a repeated failure that will likely push the rocket's debut launch beyond the March end target and delay the national space program. While no one was injured and the fire was put out within an hour, the blast damaged the facility and the cause remains unclear. An explosion could be heard and a blaze could be seen shortly after the ground combustion test started at the Tangshan Space Center in southwestern Japan, according to video from the public broadcaster NHK. JSXA said the engine test encountered a combustion abnormality 49 seconds after the ignition. It said there was no indication of injury or damage to the outside facility. The space agency partnered with Aerospace Unit of Heavy Machinery Maker IHI to develop the Epsilon S, the next generation in the Epsilon Solid Fuel Small Rocket Series. This incident came 16 months after another failed engine test derailed Japan's small rocket development. Shares in IHI were down as much as 6% in Tuesday's Tokyo trading. An IHI Aerospace spokesperson said the company is investigating the cause. At least 17 people are missing after a tourist yacht sank in the Red Sea following warnings about rough seas near Egypt. The governor of the Red Sea region, Amar Hanafi, said rescuers saved 28 people from the vessel south of the coastal town of Marsa Alam and some were airlifted to receive medical treatment. According to the Red Sea governorate, the Sea Story luxury yacht was on a five-day diving trip carrying 13 crew members and 31 tourists of various nationalities when it sank near the coastal town of Marsa Alam. The governorate said 28 survivors have been rescued so far and Egyptian armed forces have joined the rescue forces. The authorities said it is not yet clear what caused the yacht to sink, but high waves of 4 to 6 metres were forecast in the Red Sea on Sunday and Monday, leading the Egyptian Weather Agency to advise the suspension of all maritime activities. Thousands of people have marched against the government in Angola, peacefully protesting against the high cost of food and poverty, among other issues. It's the first large demonstration since the contested general election in 2022. We revisit Angola's capital of Luanda, where thousands of UNITA opposition supporters streamed into the streets this weekend, protesting against the government and the loss of the 2022 elections. Then Zimbabwe's president Emerson Nangangwa and the AFDB's Akinwumi Adesina have met with creditors this Monday to address the country's $21 billion debt. Leaders in Harare outlined plans for a debt clearance roadmap in collaboration with the IMF starting in January 2025. And in Senegal, wrestling dominates cultural importance, captivating the nation as one of the most popular sports. The country's biggest wrestling event, the Combat Royale, has just taken place this Sunday with Modu Lo crowned king of the arenas. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news coming on the other side. Stay tuned.
On the road to the White House tonight, a federal judge has dismissed a major case against Donald Trump that alleged he illegally sought to overturn the 2020 election. Jack Smith, the special prosecutor who brought the criminal case against Trump, had asked to have the charges dropped. Smith has also asked to have his case charging Trump with improperly storing classified documents dismissed. Trump had pleaded not guilty in both cases. Tonight, in a striking move, the Justice Department abandoning the federal criminal charges that had loomed over now President-elect Trump in Washington and Florida for more than a year. Special Counsel Jack Smith saying his decision does not turn on the gravity of the crime's charge, the strength of the government's proof, or the merits of the prosecution. But the DOJ has a long-standing policy against prosecuting a sitting president. And the department believes the Constitution requires dismissing the cases before the defendant is inaugurated. The judge in Washington signing off on that today. The move by Smith, while expected, a notable defeat after launching a pair of historic cases, a first of their kind against a former president. The Trump team calling today's dismissals a major victory for the rule of law, as the president-elect had made his criminal exposure a centerpiece of his campaign. Mr. Trump often railing against Smith. I would fire him within two seconds. Smith expected to step down on his own soon. His case is never getting close to trial, stymied in appeals. In Washington, the Supreme Court finding Mr. Trump immune for some of his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. While in Florida, a federal judge found Smith was wrongly appointed, dismissing the accusations Mr. Trump unlawfully ordered associates to keep classified documents at Mar-a-Lago after he left office. Also in the U.S., record numbers of travelers are expected to hit the road this Thanksgiving week. Storms from coast to coast could disrupt road and air travel, and a shortage of air traffic controllers could also slow things down. With heavy rain expected midweek from the Midwest through the East Coast, travel pros warn it could be a week of delays, just as nearly a quarter of the population travels 50 miles or more. In Boston today, an American plane clipped wings with the Frontier plane. No injuries, both planes taken out of service, passengers rebooked. Meanwhile, the FAA warns a shortage of air traffic controllers could also slow operations this week. The icing control, United 2238, Gate Charlie 29. In Chicago, United Captain Julie Savage prepping for the flight to Newark. Yeah, just want to confirm you guys will be de-icing at the gate. On this day, a snowstorm dropped three inches on O'Hare. Taking a look at the snow totals, we're already... At United's Ops Center, they use AI to watch flights and weather worldwide, moving planes and rebooking passengers. Most Americans will be driving this week, with gas averaging 305 nationally a year ago, 326. EV charging now 35 cents per kilowatt hour. Some peak congestion hours Tuesday at 3.45 p.m. on I-95 in Boston. Wednesday, 7.45 p.m. I-5 in L.A. Sunday, 3.45 on I-65 Indy to Chicago. Monday, 5.45 p.m. I-45 to Houston. Updating you now on the war in Gaza, a ceasefire deal to end the fighting between Israel and Hezbollah appears to be imminent. The U.S. says it's pushing as hard as it can to reach an agreement, but cautioned that it has not yet been finalized. The United States has said ceasefire talks to end the war in Lebanon are close to reaching an agreement. A State Department spokesperson said in a press briefing on Monday local time that it's pushing as hard as it can to get to a diplomatic resolution, but urged caution on optimism. Citing a source familiar with the matter, CNN said that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu signaled his potential approval for a ceasefire with Hezbollah with Israeli officials on Sunday night. Israel's cabinet is reportedly set to vote on the proposed deal on Tuesday. Reuters also reported that U.S. President Joe Biden and French President Emmanuel Macron are expected to announce a ceasefire in Lebanon soon, citing four senior Lebanese sources. But obstacles remain, as reports that a deal was close were met with a mixed response in Israel. Far-right Israeli National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir called the U.S.-backed ceasefire deal a big mistake and said it would be a historic missed opportunity to eradicate Hezbollah. Residents of northern Israel, 
many of whom have been displaced by the conflict, have also reportedly expressed concerns about the potential deal. Another unresolved issue is that Israeli officials have demanded the freedom to strike Hezbollah as part of any ceasefire deal, in case the Iran-backed militant group violates an emerging agreement. But Hezbollah's leader has said it wants a complete ceasefire and protection of Lebanon's sovereignty. Eyes are now on whether the two sides will be able to reach an agreement to end more than 13 months of fighting that has killed more than 3,000 people in Lebanon. Meanwhile, China's permanent representative to the United Nations, Fu Kong, urged the UN Security Council to take all necessary actions as fast as possible to deal with the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Addressing a Security Council meeting, Fu said facts have proved that any delay of the UN Security Council only means greater damage and more civilian deaths and injuries. Who said after the United States vetoed a latest UN Security Council draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the war-torn Gaza Strip on the 20th of November, hundreds of civilians have died and the situation is slipping to a more dangerous direction. Stressing that immediate efforts should be made to achieve unconditional and long-lasting ceasefire, which is an important prerequisite for saving lives, he also added that the barrier to humanitarian aid access must be removed. The implementation of international humanitarian law is a non-negotiable obligation and cannot be used as a bargaining chip any unilateral attempts trying to undermine the two state any unilateral attempt trying to undermine the two state solution must be resisted fu pointed out the un security council must prevent a larger scale regional conflict the current situation in the middle east is precarious israel must put aside its opposition with the use of force stop its attacks against lebanon syria iran and other countries and stop its provocative and adventurous actions in his remarks, he mentioned, The ongoing Gaza conflict is the biggest stress test the United Nations has ever faced in the Middle East and that they believe it first tests the UN Security Council members' ability to save lives and maintain peace, the determination to uphold the international rule of law and justice and the willingness to defend the authority of the UN Security Council mechanism and its resolutions. He said, so far, due to the negative attitude of some countries, the Security Council's performance in this test has been incompetent and they call on some countries to face up to their responsibilities and support the Security Council in using all the options in the toolbox to take further actions to achieve an immediate ceasefire and restore peace. Moving over to the Russia-Ukraine war now, fighting between the two countries is escalating ahead of the inauguration of President-elect Donald Trump, who has vowed to help end the war. More Ukrainian women are joining the military ranks as well. Russia fired more missiles at the Ukrainian cities of Kharkiv and Odessa. The war in Ukraine is escalating, with both sides rushing to gain territory before President-elect Trump's promise to bring a ceasefire. And in what may be the late rounds of this long fight, Russia has the upper hand. Despite recruitment drives, Ukraine is running out of men. So increasingly, women are taking up the responsibility. We joined a group of soldiers arming up near Kyiv. They call themselves the Witches of Bucha. 90% of this unit are women. Many of their sons and husbands are out fighting on the front lines, so they have stepped up volunteering to defend the capital. These women don't believe that even if Trump brokers a deal, Putin will honor it. So they're training for close combat. Valentina is a grandmother. Her son and son-in-law are both out on the front lines. I don't believe this war can be stopped with a negotiation, she says. Putin can't be trusted. In three to five years, he'll come back. A DHL cargo plane crashed as it came into land at Lithuania's Vilnius airport, killing one person on the aircraft and with some debris damaging a house. This was the moment a cargo plane crashed as it came into land at Vilnius Airport, Lithuania on Monday morning, captured by security cameras. It skidded into a house and killed one person on board. The crew were injured, but no one on the ground was hurt, officials said. The scheduled flight was operated by Swift Air on behalf of DHL and had taken off from Leipzig, Germany. The plane was a Boeing 737-400, an airport spokesperson said. Police and prosecutors are investigating but police said there was nothing to suggest an explosion preceded the crash. The Commissioner-General Arunas Paulauskas told reporters the possibility of terrorism couldn't be discounted. 
Germany is investigating several fires caused by incendiary devices hidden inside parcels at a warehouse in Leipzig earlier this year. British counter-terrorism police are also investigating a warehouse fire in July, caused by a package catching a light. Security officials told Reuters the exploding parcels were part of a test run for a Russian plot to trigger blasts on cargo flights to the United States. Media reports said those incidents, and one in Poland, were traced to parcels sent from Lithuania. German industrial giant Titian Krupp Steel Europe announced a plan to shrink its workforce from the current 27,000 to 16,000 within six years. The Duisburg-based company blamed an increase in cheap imports, especially from Asia, for putting an increased and significant strain on competitiveness. Another bid by German conglomerate Thyssenkrupp to stem the bleed. 5,000 more jobs are to be axed at the sprawling conglomerate. It said on Thursday that it's trying to control losses across its empire after posting a $1.9 billion operating loss in its latest financial year. Despite closing the sale of its elevators business in July for more than $20 billion, the group remains in crisis. And its CEO said more painful restructuring might be needed to stop the cash burn. The company said it expected to make a decision about what to do with its struggling steelmaking business in the spring. It had tried to set up a joint venture with India's Tata Steel, but was blocked by Brussels on antitrust grounds last year. The division swung to big losses as the global slowdown hit demand. Shares in the company, which also makes ships and car parts, have fallen about 60% this year. By Thursday afternoon, they were down another 6%, with analysts saying the outlook for the coming year was disappointing. The new job cuts come on top of 6,000 layoffs announced last year, but some investors say even the new plans don't go far enough. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news coming on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. People in wealthy Singapore have taken for granted comforts such as electricity and air conditioning for decades. But a dwindling band of residents on a tiny island to its east saw the arrival of a solar grid 11 years ago as a miracle they could still talk about. A 10-minute ferry ride from eastern Singapore takes you to the small, quiet island of Pulau Ubin. This little haven offers a rare glimpse of rural life in a country better known for its modern malls and skyscrapers. Pulau Ubin is a rural spot full of biodiversity. About 4,000 people once lived there, but after the main quarry closed in 1970, most moved to the city as it quickly modernized. Chu Yok Chun is currently one of just 30 people still living on the four square mile island. While he enjoys the quiet life, the 79-year-old feels the community has little future. Besides mail delays, and the hassle of making trips to the city for groceries and gadgets, ferry rides can also be inconvenient for island residents. One 69-year-old Lim Sai Si runs a bicycle shop on Pulau Ubin, but moved to the mainland 30 years ago due to quarry closures and his child's school commute. For many, Pulau Ubin serves as a relaxing getaway, offering hikes through lush greenery and lakes in old quarries, bike rides on car-free roads, and seafood dining by the water's edge. Every June for the last nine years, Singapore officials have held Ubin Day to celebrate the island's heritage and nature. In 2001, the government said it was safe from changes until required for development, but no one is now allowed to move there from the mainland, leaving the population to dwindle. With the island's youngest residents in their 50s, some wonder what future there is now for Pulau Ubin. Farmers in a tiny Indian village of Punjab are quietly ushering in a change from burning their farm stubble to a cleaner, greener and healthier way of farming. Farmers here used to burn paddy stubble to clear their fields. But in this tiny village in India's Punjab, farmers are ushering in a cleaner, greener way of farming. Every year, the onset of winter in northern India coincides with farmers illegally setting fires to clear crop waste or paddy stubble after the harvest. It's an outlawed practice that stokes air pollution in the region around New Delhi. It has turned the Indian capital into a virtual gas chamber 
recording hazardous levels of air pollution. The conditions prompted an outcry over the unabated stubble burning in the neighboring states of Haryana and Punjab. Here in Jaitu, about 250 miles from New Delhi, farmers are working closely with an NGO to transition from the traditional method of burning farm residue to mulching. Farmer Ranjit Singh, some of the farmers who made the leap, said they first tried mulching on a trial basis and were encouraged to expand it by their healthy harvests, among them Baljinder Singh. Among the successes, some remain skeptical of the results. And a shortage of machinery is causing a bottleneck NGOs are determined to tackle in their quest to make India's farms greener and its air cleaner. And finally tonight, Peach and Blossom are the two lucky turkeys from Minnesota who will escape a foul fate as part of a White House tradition. It is not officially Thanksgiving week until we know which turkeys will not be on the dinner table. On Sunday, folks gathered in D.C. to celebrate Peach and Blossom, two turkeys from Minnesota who are poised to become the final two turkey pardons of the Biden administration today. Over the weekend, these two, quote, VITs have been staying at the Willard Hotel in the nation's capital, where you can see employees prepared by laying down tarp and filling their suite with wood shavings. See, just like the farm. The power vested in me as president of the United States, I pardon you. And Peach and Blossom will join a long list of pardoned poultry with a history that is sort of up to debate. According to the White House Historical Association, President Lincoln is said to have once pardoned a turkey. And he is the one who proclaimed Thanksgiving as a national holiday. However, while other presidents did practice this tradition in some way, it did not become a White House tradition until President H.W. Bush gave the first official presidential pardon in 1989. <laughs> And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. We'll be back with the latest updates from across the globe tomorrow as well. Stay tuned as we've got Sanmi Mudanayaka joining you next on the Nightly Business Report. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.